Good evening. My name is Pauline McIntosh, and on behalf of St. Francis Xavier University, I would like to welcome you to the Topshi Memorial Webinar Series. St. Evax University and the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour acknowledge that we work in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This, this territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which the Mi'kmaq and the, and the Maliseet peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not, did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact, recognized Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. We strive for respectful partnerships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation. We also recognize that Nova Scotia is home to over 50 African Nova Scotian communities whose culture, heritage, and histories have been and remain a key part of this province for more than 400 years. For generations, people of African descent have experienced inequities due to systemic racism in Nova Scotia and still do today. We strive to listen to and learn from the first voice perspectives of Black Nova Scotians, amplify Black voices, support Black communities, and address inequities and injustices in our work together. The Topshi Memorial Webinar Series is sponsored by the Topshi Memorial Fund, which was established in 1984 to honor the memory of Reverend George Topshi. Topshi was the director of the St. Evax Extension Department from 1969 till 1982, and the Cody Institute from 1973 to 1979. He worked to maintain close links to organized labor, cooperators, and credit unions. Topshi saw workers in their trade unions and consumers and producers in their co-ops and credit unions as part of the same cause for social justice and economic democracy. I will now call upon Danny Cavanaugh, president of the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor to bring greetings on behalf of the Federation. Danny? Oh, thanks, Pauline, and I do apologize for my uh, camera isn't working that great, but the, the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor is a central provincial voice for Nova Scotia workers. We represent uh, 70,000 members of affiliated unions in more than 350 locals working in every aspect of the Nova Scotia economy. We were founded on a principle of justice and dignity for all and it will always be front and center in the battle for a just society. The Federation's Executive Council is made up of seven officers and 15 general vice presidents, uh, all from the major unions in the province of Nova Scotia. Uh, we have two staff members that work from our office in Halifax, and we operate um, from our convention, which is held every two years in October, and we're happy to have this partnership with Cody and folks at St. Evax University, and we're really pleased to be a presenter of this webinar tonight. So I hope everybody um, learned something tonight, gained something from these webinars, and uh, join us in any future webinars that we might have. So thanks again to everybody participating and our panelists. Thanks, Danny. And it's always a pleasure for St. of X to partner with the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor. Uh, we have a really long history of the Extension Department and now Cody Institute in particular of uh, working with labor in, in the Atlantic region. And we're really, really pleased uh, to bring new life, breathe new life into that relationship through this webinar series. So always a pleasure to work together. And before I introduce tonight's speakers, I'll just say a few words about the process. Each of our three presenters will have seven minutes to speak with you. And I will ask you, the audience, to type your questions into chat. And after everyone has presented, we'll probably have 10 to 15 minutes to respond to your questions at that time. And at this time, I'm very pleased to welcome our four speakers, Colette Robert, Debbie Richardson, Mary Otto, and Jessica McCormick. And our first speaker this evening will be Colette Robert. Colette is from Halifax and sits on the Nova Scotia Advisory Council on the Status of Women. She is president of the St. Mary's University Alumni Council, 
a member of the Canadian Mental Health Association, Nova Scotia Board, and sits on the minimum wage review committee for the province. As an academic, Colette led a master's research project in cognitive neuroscience. Recently, Colette has been involved in consulting in the areas of equity and well being and is in the process of building her own business. And Colette, it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening. And we look forward to hearing your insights and perspective on the role of women in the workplace in Nova Scotia. Welcome. Okay, so thank you so much for having me tonight. It's uh, great to see some of you. Nice to meet all of you for the for the first time. Uh, so basically what I wanted to bring with this, as was mentioned, uh, I sit on the Nova Scotia Advisory Council on the status of women. So we are a small council that meet and um, make decisions and advocate to the provincial government, sometimes the federal government in terms of how money should be spent um, in terms of, of women, women's issues and that type of thing. And my background was just briefly mentioned. I won't take up too much time around that, but basically I started off in a hardcore science program and found myself doing like uh, student leadership stuff, uh, political roles, and then got into private consulting and social impact um, and working with different levels of government here and there in terms of projects that have to do with social impact. And uh, yeah, and so now I currently sit on half a dozen boards and, and councils. Again, the Nova Scotia Advisory Council on the status of women being one of them. So the main things that I wanted to really discuss today that have been coming up around the council table in terms of women in the workplace, um, affordable health care. So that's definitely a barrier for a lot of women. Um, you know, is it worth it to work when the health, uh, the child care is so expensive? Um, and can we invest more funding in that, for example? And also, but at the very bare bones of it, uh, fundamental needs, so housing, a lot of women are struggling, especially if they're, for example, exiting um, very unhealthy situations where they need to provide housing for them and their kids um, and how they obtain that, how they can even afford that. That's, that's a huge thing in the province of Nova Scotia. And uh, parental leave. So some workplaces are making the move to have an inclusive of both partners. Um, however, other places only have some leave for the woman, for example, and even then it's very limited. So making that more accessible and more equitable. And then of course, there's also the stigma around taking parental leave. So one step would be having it offered, but once you do and you decide to take that, you know, are you missing out on certain bonuses, promotions, that type of thing for the duration of time that you're out? Other things we also frequently talk about, um, women are often hired for lower salaries than their male counterparts, and they may not have as much confidence or training around how to negotiate the salary, the benefits, all of the, the packages inclusive of that. And then oftentimes uh, you'll see, again, a lot of organizations are trying to make progress, but that it will be male dominated leadership. And sometimes women get placed into positions, let's just say an administrative position where there might not be as much of a growth opportunity, which kind of makes them stagnant within that organization. And the really progressive places in the world have been looking lately at women's health and accommodations. Um, so their unique health needs compared to men and, you know, would remote work uh, help to accommodate for that type of stuff different times of the month, that kind of thing? Um, or is it days off? And then really taking a reflection on, you know, when it comes down to it, when are the organic offers for a job or promotion presented. Uh, so, you know, historically, now this is gonna be a, a higher socioeconomic group that I refer to, but is it on a golfing trip? You know, is, is the business out on a golfing trip or they're doing some kind of golf tournament fundraiser? Or is it just saying, hey, you know what, after work, uh, you know, do you wanna go 
to grab some food and drinks? And, you know, who are you leaving out um, by inviting the people that can, you know, go to those opportunities, relationship build, that type of thing after work when other people can't? Um, so that's something I've, that we've often reflected on. <clears throat> and human resources in terms of equity. So there has been a push and you'll see, you know, all the job ads that, you know, say, you know, if you're a woman, if you're indigenous, if you're a person of color, please select these things. There's a preference for hiring these groups of people. But have you really built the framework to have the proper treatment for those people on your staff? Um, so it could be physical spaces, it could be embedded in policy. And yeah, being prepared when you do onboard the women um, to meet that quota of hiring. Um, yeah, is, is your policies in place? Um, are you willing to accommodate certain things? Are you willing to treat them equitably in terms of sourly, sourly and uh, putting them in leadership positions? And uh, <clears throat> last thing I wanted to touch on, uh, sorry about the dogs in the background, um, is unemployment. Um, and so that could be from a woman who may have taken a mat leave or a, a parental leave, uh, but that could also be in different situations where, I mean, women and men face unemployment, um, but that stigma that comes around the gaps in a resume and uh, for me in particular, uh, like I mentioned, I sit on half a dozen boards and councils right now. And over my experience and lifetime, about 22 different boards and councils. Um, when you lose your job, and, and a lot of people have lost their job in the last six months, there's a, a certain shame associated with losing a job, even if it's in the company's best interest. And, you know, how they're making those decisions and who exactly the, that they're letting go and that type of thing. And then when it comes time to re-enter the job force, if you find a position that you genuinely feel is a good fit, oftentimes that lack of confidence carries over and some women don't know how to talk about money. It's very uncomfortable to negotiate a salary, benefits package and that type of thing. So I think we should push to try to normalize that. And uh, a good friend of mine, she, she does family law. Uh, you know, she said to me, they can take your role from you, but they can't take your experience. And so with that being said, you know, you're just as credible, your, your voice and your opinions matter just as much as any other person in the room. So to keep pushing, to talk about the things that are uncomfortable and you know, whether it be within your organization or outside of your organization to focus on supporting the women that are in your in your circle as opportunities come up. And if you can, depending on your role in the organization to have an active role in the policy changes and the strategic framework development for people that are going into those leadership positions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colette. You have given us a lot to think about. And it, it strikes me that uh, when, you, when you put everything in a list format like that, it's easy to see how women internalize some of, some of what they experience in the workplace. I have often heard women who've lost their position for whatever reason express that it feels like a failure. And that failure becomes internalized, even if it's of no, no fault of their own. So it, you've really, really uh, illuminated for us the importance of thinking about this a little more analytically. You know, what are the impacts of the treatment of women in the workplace that we may not think anything of otherwise if we don't actually consider what it means to the individual and to the person and then to women more generally to have had those experiences. So thanks so much for bringing that out. Really helpful. And I'm, I'm sure there'll be some questions when we get rolling at the end. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker this evening is Debbie Richardson. And Debbie has been a member of the IATSC Local 680 since 1991. She is currently serving as its president. She is the District 11 coordinator for the IATSE International Women's Committee and is a member of the IATSE Canada Health Plan Committee. Debbie is currently the president of the Halifax Dartmouth 
Halifax Dartmouth and District Labor Council, General Vice President representing unions with membership under 1,000 with the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor, and sits on the Canadian Council for the Canadian Labor Council representing labor councils in Atlantic Canada. Debbie is the board chair of the Mayworks Halifax Festival and serves on the board of the Halifax Workers Action Centre. Debbie, we're really honoured to have you here with us this evening and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Please take it away. Thank you. Thanks. I really appreciate you inviting me to talk. What I'm going to talk about a little bit is um, progressing through uh, a union that when I joined it in 1991 was a predominantly male uh, industry. Um, so uh, I became a member of I IATSC Local 680 in 1991. Um, IATSC is the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. Um, and we, our jurisdiction covers film, television, uh, live, live events, uh, uh, live stage productions, Broadway, um, all kinds of things like that. So when in 1991, it was a predominantly male union. Uh, I was the first female member of my local in 1991. And several years after that, I became the first female uh, member of our executive board. And I've served on that executive board ever since. It was very difficult for women in our industry unless they worked in the more traditional female departments, hair, makeup, wardrobe. Those who did work in the more male dominant departments faced numerous barriers. They were expected to take whatever jobs the men would allow them to take. Uh, and then they had to be twice as good and work twice as hard to be able to advance anywhere in their career or to be accepted. The level of misogyny and harassment was also a real barrier that we needed to combat through the years. Gradually, as more women fought through these barriers to become successful in their careers and mentor the women who came behind them, more women became involved with their union. As the old guards started to be replaced with more women and men who had become, become accustomed to working side by side with women, Leadership recognized that women were a vital part of our union and were an opportunity for growth. Many locals, like mine, uh, saw this as a future and actively encouraged mentoring women to improve their skills and make this a career. As more locals did this, our international board also started on a, on a path of encouraging and educating women in job skills as well as in leadership potential. This also led to developing a culture of inclusion for all, starting with the International Women's Committee that I serve on. And now we have also have a pride committee uh, and a, a diversity, equity and inclusion committee. So uh, trying to make everyone feel welcome. While we're certainly moving in the right direction, there are always issues. Uh, many, uh, many locals uh, still struggle with pay inequity uh, for traditionally women's roles uh, like makeup and hair and, and, and wardrobe. Uh, I'm very proud to say that our local uh, for probably 20 years has had pay equity uh, for all of the jobs in, in, uh, in our, any of our agreements or contracts. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you're a head carpenter or a head of wardrobe, you get paid the same money. Uh, because if you're, if you're responsible for other people and responsible responsible for directing people, then you should get the same pay. Uh, the most important thing for, pro for progressing is having leaders that recognize the importance of women's contribution and for us to hold them accountable. When I started getting involved in the broader labor movement, um, we I was very lucky that the organizations that I began getting involved with looked at having equity between men and women serving on the executive boards uh, as, as an important thing. Um, and it, it's, it has led to really developing some really amazing female activists uh, here in Nova Scotia. And um, you know I'm really, really proud to be a part of it. Um, and that's pretty much what I have to say. 
Debbie, I was I was just saying that I'm really inspired by what you've shared uh, to hear that your organization has had pay equity for 20 years. That's absolutely amazing. And I'm, I'm also uh, wondering whether whether someone has come in and documented the story about how that happened. I think there's a tremendous amount there that can be shared with others. I was also I was also really intrigued when you expressed how women uh, began to be accepted into into uh, uh, more decision making roles, and it was really the men's growth that that opened the doors and how they they had to uh, they had to develop and th- and learn to think about things differently uh, in order for women to enter those spaces. And uh, it, it, it might just say a little bit about where we need to do a lot of the education and awareness and, and, uh, and kind of self-awareness, I think, as well as part of our work. So thank you for sharing that. Well, if I could, and, if I could add one thing to that, um, yeah, please. You, you, you made up, brought up a really good point. Um, our International Women's Committee, uh, there are two of us that represent the two districts in Canada and everybody else obviously is in, in, in the States. And we're very much more progressive here in Canada with what we do. Um, When we have uh, our district conventions and we have um, our women's event, we get the men to come and we try and educate them. And some, some some of the results have been really, really astounding of us being able to speak frankly about the types of things that affect us in the workplace they they have no idea about Mm. yeah yeah interesting and while it may not be our responsibility to to educate the men I suppose if we are helping them find the way that's not a bad thing that's not a bad thing good stuff thanks so much Debbie and I can see there's some comments brewing in in chat and I'll, I'll be really keen to get to those when we hear from our other speakers as well so Thanks so much. Mary Otto is our next presenter this evening, and Mary has been an, has been active in the labor movement for over 20 years and has worn many hats during this time. Currently, Mary is the president of the NSGEU Local 43. She sits on the board of directors of the Nova Scotia Government and General Employees Union and sits on the executive council of the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor as a general vice president, NSGEU. In addition to her work in the labor movement, Mary is passionate about healthcare advocacy, working to protect public health, public health care, and sits on the board of directors of the Nova Scotia Health Coalition. Welcome, Mary. Thank you. Um, I've got a tough act to follow there uh, with both Colette and Debbie, um, but. Uh, So I guess I want to speak to um, a little bit about my experience. So I was listening to the two of you speak um, and it kind of brought things to mind. Um, So a little bit different from Debbie, I come out of the NSGU and we are majority women. Um, We have 70 plus percent who of our members identify as women. Um, And I also work in healthcare. So I work for Canadian Blood Services in the lab and the majority of my local are women. Um, But that doesn't mean that it's a magical utopia where misogyny um, doesn't exist. And we have a lot of work to do. Um, I was very lucky that I uh, was a baby when I started working at Canadian Blood Service. That's what I like to say. Um, I like to say they stole my youth. Um, But I was very lucky to find a unionized job when I was in my early 20s, and I became active in my local. And I got dragged along by strong women into getting more involved within the NSGU. And um, I've got to admit, I stepped away from some of the broader stuff for a little while. And then I got to a point where I was like, you know what? F it, I'm middle-aged, I've got a strong voice, I just, I can't put up with it anymore, so I need to just throw myself into it, um, more so than I was. Um, When I say I wear many hats, I still wear many hats, Um, and I think it's one of the barriers that we have getting involved in things and leadership roles is it's hard to put yourself out there sometimes. As women, we're trained to, you know, be quiet, 
We don't, you don't want to brag about yourself. You don't want to be, you know, who does she think she is? And I sometimes don't say like all of my accomplishments or the things I do because again, but I've stopped, I've decided at this point, no, these are things that I've done. They're my accomplishments. I'm proud. I have this experience and, you know, why let somebody belittle that? But like I said, we've done a lot of work in the NSGU um, around women's issues. But I'll have to say within the last year, I've still been told that I'm in some of the positions I'm in by a man that it was because they let me. I've been told <laughs> that the only reason that I'm there is be in an elected position is because they let me. <laughs> and it's like, that's not how it works. Um, I was at a meeting not that long ago where somebody asked me a question and a man sitting next to me spoke for me. <laughs> I ha I was talking to another person who within a at a union um, thing, she got patted on the head and told and called sweetheart. <laughs> so it, it, even in a woman dominated union, woman dominated field, it still exists. Um, and I think we also need to do a better job um of making sure that we have diversity at the table that all women's voices are heard um and i think that's where we as union i know within the nsgu it's something that i really pushed for was and i'm really happy that the rest of the board was immediately on board um is making sure that you know all women's voices are heard uh so trans women <laughs> Are women. There is no gender equity without trans women, without gender diverse people sitting at the table. Um, so I'm really happy that NSGU actually developed, um, out of some of these conversations, a program on workers helping support workers in gender transition. Um, and I think that brings me to some of my roles in the political action. <laughs> I'm just kind of jumping around to here a bit. But so I'm the chair of the political action committee for the Federation of Labor. And one thing, and make no doubt about it, unions are absolutely political, especially if you get into leadership, but we need more women in politics. Nova Scotia is one of four provinces that's never had a woman premier. I think we've had more men named John sit in the legislature than we have women. I went through the list of women who've been elected, um, and it has jumped up a bit, but in the last 200 and something years, we've had, I think, 62 women MLAs which is next to enough, you know, it's, and I think there are those barriers in place and we have to identify not just, and, and again, we need to ensure that we have diverse voices at the table. It's, and I feel like that's my job now as a middle-aged white lady <laughs> is trying to make sure that I help amplify um, those diverse voices and know when to shut up and let other people speak. <laughs> which is sometimes hard to do because I like I said earlier to somebody I can talk the my mother says I can talk the air off a dead donkey I'm one of those loud women who are you know um and that's something I've uh I really encourage everybody who's watching who ends up watching this um I was really lucky to have really strong women mentors I still have and I was talking to a friend of mine who, again, we were both in our 20s when we got involved within the union, and we're now finding ourselves in our 40s. And we've become mentors ourselves, and we're sort of in that, it's kind of an interesting place to be. But one thing I've always tried to do, and I really encourage others to do, is because, again, unions, workplaces are very, they can be very cliquey, intimidating places, but reaching out to people when you see them come in, build those relationships and mentor and make sure that people feel welcome and make sure that they feel that their voices are heard. So I really challenge everybody um, because I think that's how we're going to get those women involved, get, you know, get those voices at the table. Um, yeah, I guess, I don't know. And I think that's probably, I probably blathered on, but uh, yeah, uh, thank you for having me and uh, thanks. Mary, thank you. My goodness, it's been really, uh, really enlightening to hear your remarks. And you've really reminded us of the role of women and the role of women leaders in nurturing the leadership that's going to follow them and how really important it is for us to be thinking about that uh, in the work that we do, uh, in the space that we occupy in our workplaces, whether we have an official title of leader or not. 
we are all leaders in some way. And for us to be really mindful about uh, how we treat those who are coming after us and, uh, and how we can inspire leadership in the people who are, who are coming behind us. So really helpful to hear that. I also really appreciated what you had to say about opening spaces for diversity and how sometimes that means not just creating space for other people's voices, but acknowledging that sometimes we need to be silent in those voices. That's really, really powerful. And I think that's a message that we can all appreciate hearing and being reminded of. Uh, it's unfortunate that we all know of women who are still being uh, treated very inappropriately in our workplaces and spaces. And I'm sure we all can share examples of that. But I think you've given us a great, um, a great way forward, and that's to get involved, to be politically active, uh, to make sure that we are raising voices, not only our own, but creating spaces for others and always advocating for the kind of change that can eventually um, see, see a world in which we don't have to be called darling and sweetheart and be patted on the head in a diminutive way. So thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. Incredibly important. I really appreciate what you, what you had to say. And having heard three wonderful speakers thus far, I think this is the time to hear from our final panelist for this evening, and that is Jessica McCormick. And Jessica is the president of the Newfoundland and Labrador Federation of Labor, representing 70,000 workers across the province in every sector of the economy. Jessica has more than a decade of experience working in labor and social justice movements, in addition to her work with unions, she has served on the board of directors of Oxfam Canada, as well as the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Prior to her role with the Newfoundland and Labrador Federation of Labour, Jessica was a public relations, communications and research officer with the Newfoundland and Labrador Association of Public and Private Employees. She has also worked as a director of public affairs with the Fish, Food and Allied Workers Union, and has served as a national chairperson of the Canadian Federation of Students, representing more than 600,000 college and university students. In May of 2021, Jessica was a speaker at TEDx Harborside Park. Her, her talk highlighted the precarious nature of gig economy jobs and the role unions can play in building a more just and equitable society. Jessica, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pauline, and thank you, everybody, um, for uh, having me this evening um, to the Cody Institute and the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to join you. Um, I'm joining you tonight from St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, the unceded traditional territory of the Beothic and the Mi'kmaq. And while I'm here today in my capacity as president of the Newfoundland and Labrador Federation of Labor, I'm also proud to say that I was born and raised in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. Um, I've been living and working in Newfoundland and Labrador for the past 17 years, uh, but I'll always call Cape Breton home and I try to get back there to visit my uh, parents as often as I can. Um, and it's been wonderful to hear from Colette, Debbie, and uh, Mary tonight. You've, uh, you know, given me lots of ideas um, and inspiration uh, for my own work. And you've touched on a few topics that I'd like to expand on a little bit more um, as I get into um, some of what I'd like to share. So um, I guess I'll start uh, with a little bit of history um, about myself and how I found myself in the position of president at the Newfoundland and Labrador Federation of Labor. Um, as I said, I grew up in Cape Breton, um, and my grandfather was a member of the United Mine Workers. He worked in the Princess Colliery in Sydney Mines, um, and the mine closed 12 years before I was born. So um, I didn't, you know, see the the day to day life of of miners in Sydney Mines. Certainly, there are lots of other, you know, mines in operation in the province um, throughout my life. Um, but the impact of the mine and trade unionism in Cape Breton were all around me as I was growing up. Um, but it wasn't until I was a little bit older that I made the connection between my grandfather's um, activism in the trade union movement and my own activism and involvement in the union movement. It was about 75 years after my grandfather um, was involved in his union that I found my own place in the labor movement. Um, and it started when I was in university. 
Um, growing up in a working class family in Cape Breton, um, my options were pretty limited when it came to uh, accessing post-secondary education. Um, tuition fees are incredibly high in Nova Scotia. They were when I graduated from high school and they continue to be. Um, so like so many of my peers, I was eager to, you know, get out of my parents' house and, you know, see other parts of the country and the world. Um, but what was most affordable to me at the time was Memorial University in Newfoundland and Labrador. And at the time they had the lowest uh, tuition fees in the country. Um, so it was at MUN that I got involved in the student union because I understood firsthand how important it is to ensure that education is accessible and affordable and that we should, you know, really be eliminating any barriers that people face to, to going to college or university. And from there, I went on, um, as Pauline said in my um, bio, to serve as the national chairperson for the Canadian Federation of Students. Um, and it was in that role that I got my uh, first taste, certainly of what it's like to be involved in union activism, but also um, what it's like to be um, a woman in a leadership position and the challenges that come along with it, um, the sexism and misogyny that is directed at you as a woman in a leadership role. And I, I certainly wasn't the first woman to um, be the chairperson of that organization and, and not the last, um, but I, I did deal with my fair share of um, of, of sexism in that role. So I wanted to share a couple of examples of that um, uh, because I think it's important to, important to kind of name it uh, when it happens. Um, you know, when I was first running or when I was running for re-election as, as national chairperson, I recall um, finishing an election speech at a, at a, you know, convention kind of setting. And I was feeling really good about it at the time. Um, and I opened up Twitter, um, you know, a hotbed of, uh, of misogyny um, today and as it was uh, back then uh, to see anonymous tweets um, that were questioning whether I would be fit to lead an organization if based on my appearance I didn't look like I could take care of myself. Um, a year later, um, you know, after another, you know, big campaign ad that we have been working on, um, I was bombarded by, by more tweets, um, this time by another anonymous account that had doxxed me. So they shared uh, private information, personal information about me, my phone numbers, addresses, and contact information for my family, um, inviting um, harassment. Um, and I don't share those stories for, you know, to make anybody feel pity. Um, in fact, I feel like, you know, these days, uh, most people are desensitized to the hate and harassment that women and gender diverse people experience online. And it's even worse for trans women um, in leadership positions and trans women who are online um, talking about their life and talking about their experiences. Similarly, uh, uh, for Black women, Indigenous women, racialized women in leadership positions. I was lucky back then. Um, I had a strong support network around me. Um, and I was fortunate to find really incredible labor movement mentors um, who helped me find my way um, in, in activism. Um, Lana Payne, who's now the president um, of Unifor, and Mary Shortle, the uh, previous president of the Newfoundland and Labrador Federation of Labor. Um, I spent five years uh, working for the Fish Food and Allied Workers uh, Union, as you heard in my bio, um, learning the ins and outs of the fishing industry in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, it was and still is a male dominated industry as it is in Nova Scotia. Um, and as a woman working in the union, it wasn't always easy. Um, but I did find a lot of inspiration in uh, talking to other women, uh, particularly women who were working in the fishery, actively working in the fishery, um, who persisted despite tremendous amounts of sexism, discrimination, and um, some pretty dire economic circumstances. Um, and I often refer back to this story that I learned while I was working at FFAW of a woman named Roseanne Doyle. Um, and it's a great example of perseverance um, in a male dominated industry. Um, Roseanne was a uh, someone who fished with her husband in Whitless Bay. It's a community on the Southern shore of Newfoundland and Labrador. And even though she was doing the same work as a man in the fishery, um, she wasn't eligible for employment insurance benefits. Um, so she took her fight for equality um, all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada and she won employment insurance benefits for all women working in the fishery. It's a huge accomplishment. Um, Union women uh, like Roseanne are not strangers to being on the front lines for advocating and achieving victories. 
um, in the name of working women, victories that will ultimately benefit all workers, um, whether it's maternity leave um, and parental leave, paid domestic violence leave, um, and progress organizing new workers in, in sectors like retail, which have been historically underrepresented by unions. Uh, women are really leading the charge. Um, so I, I guess, um, and I see Pauline, you've turned your screen on again, which means I'm getting close to my time. Um, I wanted to just mention a couple of uh, key issues that I think as a labor movement are kind of the next battles that we need to fight to make progress for women and gender diverse people in the workplace. Um, you know, most recently we won federal pay equity legislation. Canada recently ratified ILO C-190, which is a commitment to uh, a world free of workplace, uh, a world free of harassment and violence, particularly gender-based violence. Um, we need to implement um, those commitments. Um, both in the provinces and across the country. Um, we need to create a national care strategy. I think the care economy um, is a, an incredibly important issue that we need to be talking about. Uh, you know, it disproportionately employs women, especially racialized and, and immigrant women. Um, I think we need to think about uh, how we realize the commitment to uh, affordable childcare in Canada and how we do that without exploiting um, the people who work in the childcare um, sector who are predominantly women. Um, and okay, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll kind of wrap it up by um, leaving it here. Um, this past November, I was elected president of the, the Federation of Labor. Um, so I've only been on the job for four months. Um, at 35, I'm the youngest um, and one of only four women to serve uh, in the role in the Federation's history. I'm also the first member of the 2SLGBTQIA plus community to serve in the role. Um, and when I put my name forward for election, I did it because I had benefited from the mentorship of feminist trade unionists who came before me and who made space for me in the movement. Uh, but I also did it because I wanted to, um, as some of the other panelists talked about, reimagine what leadership looks like, um, but particularly in the labor movement. And I really do think that we need to create space for women in leadership at all levels and specifically uplift young women, gender diverse people, Black, Indigenous, and racialized workers. Um, and if we truly want to tackle inequality and make progress for women um, and gender diverse workers, we need to transform our movements ourselves um, and do, uh, I think, a little bit of introspection and think about what our leadership looks like. Um, I guess I'll leave it there, Pauline, and I'm, I'm looking forward to answering some of your questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jessica. And uh, I'll just start by saying if one was ever to leave Cape Breton, the only other place I would go would be Newfoundland. So I'm, I'm right with you on that choice. <laughs> and as a, as a MUN alum myself, I, I can certainly understand the movement. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all that you've shared. And I think you really have uh, taken what, what Mary and Debbie and Colette uh, um, started in, in their conversations, and you've taken that to a new level. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the fight for women's equality in our workplaces is, is, is a fight for everyone's equality in our workplace, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, and to really think about how do we transform our own leadership, which starts with perhaps transforming ourselves and how we show up in our, in our workplaces and spaces and, uh, and watching that, that transformation hopefully grow. So absolutely wonderful. Wow, it, it, fantastic, incredible sharing this evening. And I'm really, really pleased at this point uh, to open it up for some discussion. We've had some great points uh, raised in the chat thus far. And I think we can certainly uh, just open it up for some broad conversation for the next 10 minutes or so and see where that takes us. I think uh, some people were, were wondering and may have questions for each other on our, on our, on our panel. So that's absolutely fine as well. Um, Carolyn Clackdoyle is asking if we can address size of women in male dominated positions as in military and in the trades leading to marginalization with tech is size less a factor. And I'm not sure if Carolyn had hoped for any one of you in particular to respond to this question. Uh, so I will just leave it open. And if anyone would like to kick us off, that will be most appreciated. I guess I'm, 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 I'm kind of wondering if Carolyn can provide a little more clarification. Like, I, I guess I'm wondering if you're talking about like fat phobia in workplaces, Carolyn, 
um, and like, I guess, ability and, and, and disability. Um, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly what the question is getting at. And maybe another panelist has, has more insight than me. Um, I'm just thinking kind of about how to approach it. Mm -hmm. So Carolyn, maybe we'll give you an opportunity to, to maybe expand on that question or offer a little bit of clarity. I think there was a question for Debbie a little bit earlier that talks or asks about what about writers unions and producers unions? Are women on the rise in these unions as well? Debbie? Um, yes, they are. Um, as many of you know, uh, the Oscar for uh, Best uh, Adapted Screenplay this year was won by Canada's own Sarah Polly. So that was a wonderful, uh, a wonderful thing. However, um, she was left off the Best Director list. Um, there's only been one woman who's won a Best Director Oscar in the history of the Oscars, and that was Catherine Bigelow uh, for The Hurt Locker, which was a few years back. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely uh, still an issue. There's a really uh, fantastic uh, documentary on Netflix. It's called This Changes Everything. Uh, and it's, um, it's a group of actresses. Uh, Gina Davis is the, the pinpoint of it. She has a, a gender equity um, um, institute. Uh, and she, uh, they have put together a lot of information. Um, so they're, they, uh, it discusses the, uh, the gender equity and gender discrimination in the media and entertainment industry. So a lot of them talk about how they were shamed for their bodies in their early careers, especially those that started off quite young. Um, and also the struggles they had to try and be heard and to try and get projects um, put forward and accepted by men. There are definitely more producers than directors that are women, um, but uh, you know, it's, 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 it's still on the, on, on the downside. Very interesting, Debbie. Thank you for sharing that and, and some really recent examples uh, of, with Sarah Pauly, of course. And uh, it really highlights uh, that their accomplishments have been made and, and yet there's a long road to travel. Yeah, so thanks for that. Uh, we haven't heard back from Carolyn yet with any uh, clarification of her question, uh, but I'm just wondering, having heard each other speak, would you like to, to react to or comment on, on what some of your, your fellow presenters um, shared? And Mary, it looks like you're, you're ready to go. I had a lot of thoughts, but one of the things is I'm so sorry that you were doxxed and that happened, but I think that really highlights um, when we talk about how do we get women more involved in politics, I've thought about it. And one of the things I've thought about is if I run for, because I've, I've strongly considered and my, my father was like, you need to run for like regional council or something. And one of the thoughts, one of the first thoughts that came into my head was, how much am I going to get, and pardon my language, that fat bitch, like who does she think she is? You see it, you see people like talk about being, you know, with reporters, with you put yourself in a leadership position, you're that fat bitch, you can't shut up, you deserve to be raped, you're gonna get killed. And that is the vitriol that comes out. And I've seen it, and I've seen it too, like, you know, it, it, it's what happens when you're loud, you speak out, you get that aimed at you. And I don't think that men have to think about that in the same way. Am I going to get rape threats? Am I going to get my body like dissected? Who does she think, you know, it's, and I think that really leads to women not wanting to be in that space because it's not necessarily psychologically safe. And it's, it's not, anyway, that just sort of popped into my head when I was thinking about yeah, it's not a pleasant experience. And I think that's something we have to call out. And, uh, but thank you for sharing that. And as sucky as it is, I think it's a really good point. So Mary, the first thing, the first, one of the first things that came to mind as you were speaking is that it's, it's happening to women everywhere. And we've certainly heard a lot about it of women in the media who, who have to uh, withstand this horrible, horrible treatment by men who might be driving by on the street when they're they're cutting a news story, you know, and things of that nature. So it's happening in every different part of society. 
you know, it certainly happens to teachers in schools and, and, and you know, women bus drivers and everything else, every other position. But you're right, how do we create safer spaces in order for women to realize their own leadership? And to, to how do we make those spaces places where people aren't going to be uh, subject to undue harm as a result of standing in them? Yeah, so I'd love to hear responses from other panelists as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to I'd love, love to comment on it. And thank you, Mary, for your comments. Um, you know, it's uh, it's interesting. I uh, the at the beginning of March, I had the opportunity to travel to New York to be a delegate to the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. And the theme for that session was around technology and innovation to advance gender equality. Um, and, you know, the the uh, UN sanctioned like government hosted events. Um, focused a lot on how we can use tech as a tool to advance gender equality, um, you know, to tackle violence against women and gender diverse people. But it was actually the NGOs and the, the nonprofits and, and uh, feminist organizations who organized parallel to the events that were getting into topics around how tech is actually used against, uh, against us um, in so many spaces. Um, and, you know, there were a couple of sessions that I was at where we heard from um, you know, women who were members of, of parliament and, and members in government in other countries um, who were really driven out of those spaces because of the, the violence that they experienced online. And so I think we really need to think about, um, you know, how we tackle um, tech and social media, I think, as you know, uh, from a really like high level um, as, a, as a country, um, what are we doing um, to ensure that those, those um, companies are, are regulated and are safer spaces? Um, and, and then I think, what are we doing as organizations, um, political parties to support uh, people who we are recruiting to run for office? Um, and, and, um, and I think that there's a lot of work to do on that front, but I just wanted to say thank you to Mary for your comments because I think it was really insightful and I'm interested to hear what some of the other panelists think. Thank you, Jessica. Colette or um, Debbie? Yeah, um, I just wanted to, to mention one of the other barriers to women going into politics um, is that the childcare issue. Um, I remember a couple of years ago um, the, uh, when the mayor of uh, Cape Breton Regional Municipality was, was elected, she was a brand new mother and she got so much flack for bringing her baby to work with her. And, um, you know, I have several friends who, uh, who are in the legislature that have small children and, you know, the leg legislature sits strange hours, uh, sometimes like 1 p.m. to 11 p.m. like that doesn't make any sense for anybody's lifestyle uh, to to have to work in 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 those hours. Um, so you know, I think I think that's another thing that that is a real barrier to women going into, into into politics is the fact that they really have a lot of the times it's it's women that have older children that they don't have to give as much care to. Uh, but you know, it's 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 still a big barrier. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Call this. Um, I don't think, I think um, the panelists have mentioned quite a bit. They covered quite a bit. I don't know if there, if you wanted to make room for another question or. Sure. I'm just looking at in chat here and, and Carolyn has offered that running for election in the world of household cameras at the doorbell and with social media, Maybe we need women to rally around a candidate first and then introduce her to community so that she avoids private spaces that are more vulnerable in campaigning. So a really practical tool that could be incredibly helpful and could offer a lot more safety uh, to women who do decide to run for political office at whatever level. Yeah, great. Uh, not a question, just a comment on childcare. So this <clears throat> clearly follows up, uh, Debbie, your comments that um, <clears throat> I believe that not only affordable childcare is important, but accessible childcare. Many women work in positions that are not serviced by regular childcare hours. So healthcare, maintenance, forestry, et cetera. Uh, people of all genders may have barriers to enter certain work fields because there is simply no childcare center open for back shifts, weekends, holidays, et cetera. 
And certainly we, we learned a lot about this during the pandemic if we, if we weren't aware prior to that. Uh, Carolyn has also commented that firefighters mostly male and policing, yet women could do those roles differently if she is a smaller size. So interesting way to look at it as well. And uh, also a comment talking in the media about the sacrifice men make to support their spouses take a public role. What does it take to get a good support from one spouse? So an interesting cut at that as well. So those are all of the comments we have in chat at this point. Um, I think it's seven. It's seven fifty-eight. But before we leave, I would just love to hear uh, one one message of hope that perhaps each of you are feeling at this point uh, as we leave the space this evening, and or maybe just one thing that's exciting you about the role of women in our workplaces and something that you see as a positive development on the horizon. Colette, may I start with you? Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm not sure who exactly on this uh, video call um, identifies as male, but if I had to guess, there's at least a couple. And I just wanted to say thank you to the males that were here as allies to listen to us, because oftentimes in these spaces, it's just women talking about it which is great, but we also need the men to hear these things. Um, so I, I just want to say thank you so much to the men for joining and hopefully they can carry that on to their counterparts and that type of thing. So I think that that's a, a gleaming bit of hope for me. Great, thanks Colette. Debbie? Um, I think one of, one of the things that, you know, kind of gives me hope is, uh, as Jessica said, she'd gone down to New York to the to the UN and to see all of those strong Canadian uh, labor activists down there fighting for women all over the world uh, is really inspiring. Uh, the fact that the, uh, the CLC uh, currently has three out of the four uh, executive positions, women, uh, I think is is really important for us. And, you know, they're they're strong women with uh, with a a definite agenda and they're getting getting things done so i think that's very very promising for us oh great thank you debbie great great words to end on and mary a parting comment um what's giving me hope right now is young workers i and young people in general i look at um you know i've got cousins who are in their early 20s people i work with who are you know, coming in in their early 20s, um, people like who Nicole Turple, who's on the call, she's a young worker. It really is just giving me so much hope because I hear a lot and I really like push back with the whole people grumbling, oh, young people, they don't have a work ethic. No, they have more to fight against and they are. They're not taking mistreatment. They're standing up for their rights and they're standing up for the planet. Like it just gives me so much hope because because part of me is scared the world is on fire and it's gonna burn down. But I feel like if we can connect with young people and like, I think they're gonna change the world. And I, I really like, there are so many strong young women who I think are just going to like be the savior of us, to be honest, but it really brings me hope. So that's young people, <laughs> they're awesome. They right. want to burn down, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Wonderful, Mary. Thank you so much. And I think if we look, they, the young people have already changed the world and are doing a great, a great, uh, a great service to all. Thank you. Jessica. Wow. Um, how do I follow that, Mary? That was a great note to, to end it on. But um, I guess what's giving me hope, and it's kind of in a similar vein, is uh, seeing new organizing and who is leading that organizing in workplaces, um, spaces that are, you know, a work that is dominated by women and gender diverse people, particularly, you know, places like Sephora in Canada, um, mm -hmm. places like Starbucks. There are young uh, women who are, are leading a lot of that uh, unionization. Um, and that really inspires me. Um, and, and just to kind of echo Mary's comments, the, the young uh, labor leaders, um, 
uh, you know, the people who, who I see uh, alongside me, in, you know, stepping up into these roles. Um, I think that that's gonna really fundamentally uh, change things um, for women in the workplace. Um, and, you know, we have to walk the talk um, as a labor movement. So when we, when we change internally, we can ensure that the, the work that we do externally changes as well. So um, that's what's giving me hope right now. And obviously just being on this panel tonight with you all, um, getting to have a little touch point with my comrades in Nova Scotia has been um, wonderful. And um, I really have enjoyed hearing from you all. So thank you. Thanks, Jessica. And I can certainly say that hearing from each of you is giving me a tremendous amount of hope to hear about the leadership that you're providing in your perspective areas. And uh, uh, certainly, certainly there's a lot of good work happening out there. And I feel very, very comfortable that uh, and privileged to have, have each of you as leaders in this field. So thank you. Danny, I'm going to turn it over to you for any closing remarks that you would like to make before we say our final uh, farewell for the evening. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Pauline. And I want to say thank you to each of our panelists. I am a bit, bit uh, disappointed in our numbers tonight. And, you know, I think with the number of members that we represent, you know, I would have liked to see our numbers much higher than they are. And a lot of people, you know, say they believe in the issues, but to me, it's joining these webinars, getting to hear what some of the barriers really are, what are some of the things that women face, you know, in the workplace, in life, um, are all important issues that, you know, that the participation is just a bit low. And I, I say that not to be negative, to be, to be realistic about, you know, the numbers are, uh, what the numbers are and the amount of members that we represent in this province are what they are. So hopefully we can not get too discouraged by that, but continue on with this work and make sure that, you know, we continue to get the message out. The good thing is this will be recorded so people will get to listen to it afterwards and, and that's not a bad thing. So I, it was a great conversation tonight. I know that I've learned a lot and I want to thank each of you um, for your participation tonight because you uh, made a lot of really good, excellent points. And don't be surprised if you hear from me again looking for your help and assistance uh, on <laughs> some other things. So anyway, thanks. And thank you, Pauline. Excellent job uh, moderating the event tonight. And thanks to Brian for his behind the scenes work. So it was uh, really thanks. great. Thank you, Danny. And, and as always, it's wonderful to work with you. And uh, I too would like to thank the people behind the scenes who make this, these webinars happen, including Joan Wark at the, at the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor and here the wonderful Cody Communications team uh, led by Brian Lazuri and uh, Jenny McDonald and Susan Hawks. They do a fabulous job of getting the word out uh, for these important webinars. And as Danny said, it will be posted on our website uh, tomorrow probably. And then we circulated through social media. So while we may have had a smaller crowd this evening, we certainly do get lots of hits after these events. And sometimes people, uh, you know, just have so many competing uh, interests for their time that we know they can't all be here, even if they hope to. And uh, but they will probably join us uh, for the recording at some point. So with that, I want to finally just thank each of you again, uh, Jessica, Debbie, Mary, and Colette. We really appreciate your time this evening and uh, the learning that has happened here will be shared with others and it's truly inspiring to hear from each of you. And we certainly appreciate and know that you're all very busy and appreciate the time you've spent with us this evening. And we'll, with that, I'll just one final acknowledgement to the Topshi Memorial Fund for its sponsorship of this webinar series. And I will bid you all a lovely evening and I hope to see you again in one of our future webinars. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank Thanks. you so Good much. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.